And so how did this whole idea come about? It came out in a couple different ways, I think. I mean, you know, there was a couple different elements that sort of joined together to, to make the sort of germ of the ideas grow. And I think that one of them was, I was inspired on one hand by this magazine, Heavy Metal, which I'm a big fan of. Um, it's, a, it's an illustrated fantasy magazine that, you know, it's a bit of a dork magazine, but it's cool. Uh, but it has a lot of cool, like, uh, There's sort no of- There's no judgment here. Yeah, it's, it's good. That's, <laughs> Uh, but there, there's a lot of cool, like, sort of sci-fi uh, um, little comics. They're not comics. You know, they, they get the best illustrators in the world and make these awesome little stories. Um, so that's heavy metal. And then on the other side, you know, there was this, just this idea of this structure of having this sort of musical framework for the movie. This yeah, just like crazy, fun, wild stuff. Like a B-52 bomber and... A dragon. Let, let's just be clear on that. On a live action big budget movie, we have a fifty a B fifty two bomber and a dragon. AKA Patters, welcome to Presentation Saturday, where I bring you a book, an idea, something that's been on the tip of my brain. Here, sucker. It's sucker punch. Not I'm gonna get you sucker. A great movie, by the way. Zack Snyder's Sucker Punch. The art of. This one is beefy. Let's go. What's up, AKA Patters? I'm hoping all of you are binge watching the Rebel Moon Universe now available on Netflix. If you guys are not aware, this past Friday, one day ago, Rebel Moon Part 2, uh, something something giver, dropped on Netflix and the internet gets set on fire because, you know, you cannot like a Zack Snyder movie at all. You just can't. You're not allowed to do that on the internet. You're a bad person if you like Zack Snyder, period. Welcome to the channel, my friends. Peter A. DeLuca here, a.k.a. Pat69. And say with me, known throughout Philadelphia, PA, Europe, and the vast multiverse as your, your eclectic one, and in some small circles, the pop culture pope. Sucker Punch is a good movie. We live in an age where uh, mental illness is everywhere. It's a buzzword, people sell apps now, you can, you can actually download an app on your phone to solve your mental illness. <sighs> Just one small subscription away. We live in a world where mental illness is just on the tips, tips and the brains of everyone. We're always talking about it, it's always right there. I take a crap in the Philadelphia alley and plastered on the brick wall is a uh, mental illness something something right and we kind of forget a lot of these movies that were ahead of the curve now when it comes to mental illness we like to go to awakenings and we like to go to one flew over the cuckoo's nest but what if a person still connected to their teenage roots their teenage veins for the love of heavy metal, for the love of boobies and hot girls and just attractiveness and giant robots and machine guns and explosions and WW2 imagery. What happens if that filmmaker wants to make the biggest statement on mental illness and how it is treated? Well, if you guys haven't guessed already, I'm speaking to you about Sucker Punch, a movie that I remember back in the Ain't It Cool News days, when the original images dropped, a drawing, a drawing by Zack Snyder, just an idea dropped, and that was a destination. You had to go read that article. That was back when Zack Snyder was a promising filmmaker and not, uh, you know, divisive as he is now. Purposely, I don't think he's divisive at all. I think he's fantastic. I, as I've already said, I'm a fan of Zack Snyder. So, Sucker Punch and Mental Illness. What am I discussing? What am I talking about? What am I trying to say to you? So, when our girl here, 
right? What's her name? Honey Boo Suckle Suckle Punch. What's her name? Hold up here. Let's find our girl. Right here. Look at this. Oh my God. Look at ah. Oh mercy. But when this baby babe right here, sweet. Oh no. Right here, baby doll. Baby doll. Okay. She's our title character. Baby Dog gets sent to a mental institution to treat a trumped up charge of mental illness. Now, uh, this relates to a place that's about a 15 minute Uber ride from me in West Philly. It's an abandoned mental ward. And there, here's the crazy thing, a little bit of Philadelphia lore for you. A lot of businessmen and lawyers and the politicians that work where I live, Center City, Philadelphia, they would, uh, you know, just like, I guess, like mentally and probably physically abuse some of their secretaries and the women of the office to such a degree that they would send them uh, for like a weekend in West Philly that was a part like spa, part mental ward to get their heads straight. So a lot of the opening and where how we're introduced into the world of Sweet Pea in Soccer Punch, uh, it hits a little bit home for me because I've had people tell me those stories. Now, given, you know, there's some exaggeration in this world, but, you know, you take it at face value, right? You take it with a grain of salt. But Sweet Pea uh, gets admitted to a mental institution, and from that point on, uh, she's stuck there, and she creates friends. And then we get these fantasy sequences, Okay, everything that we saw in the trailers, everything, the imagery that comes to us. For Sucker Punch, we get those images. And, well, you guessed it. No, did you guess it? I don't think so. But through those images, we find out that Sweet Pea is dancing. She's performing uh, because inside this mental ward is part brothel. What? Well, uh, Isaac Iserson, Mr. Apocalypse himself, runs this part of the brothel. And Sweet Pea performs, and then in her mind, she gets through it, and then we see kind of what's happening in her mind as she's getting through it. That's one take. The other take is that uh, her mind is fighting against uh, a level of resistance. We might say the word no flows through her. All right, guys, uh, excuse me. I had a phone call and I had to scream into my phone for a little bit there. Welcome to the intense IT life. Sometimes for me, IT means uh, intense technology, not information technology. We were talking about Sucker Punch, the mental illness movie, you know, those apps we were talking about earlier. Give me a second here because I, I, I just want to show off a baby doll if you don't remember, Baby Doll is our, you know, she's our main, she's she's our character right here, Baby Doll. Hotty hot, look at the hot babes, okay? This is the side of Sucker Punch that I refer to as the male teenage fantasy. And come on, we have to be honest, in today's modern age, also the female non-binary fantasy here. I mean, look at, ah, let's give it a look right there. Ah, loving it. So... We got one flew over the cuckoo's nest and we have awakenings. Those would be, you know, the artsy top tier mental illness movies. But we have Sucker Punch. And Sucker Punch is a tangent if we were to draw a thread from those two movies. And by tangent, I mean is that Zack Snyder basically jammed, uh, uh, he rammed everything he loved about heavy metal. The thong, the boobs. The, the, the flying lizard, the blood, the guts, the machine guns, all of these things. All these things that make the heavy metal animated movie, you know, kind of like too good but not to watch, right? Like you, you don't want to watch it, but you do want to watch it. That's the forbidden fantasy part of heavy metal. This is also a note that has disappeared from modern culture and modern entertainment. We really don't do this anymore. Soccer Punch is derived from that. 
And what we have kind of like the middle, the nucleus, this baby doll character, she gets put away. She becomes a problem. She gets put away into a mental institution, a form of just dealing with her as a person. We need to get rid of her. We can't send her to China or a prison or to a salt mine. We have to send her to a mental institution. And Walter Isaacson, Walter Isaacson, is that the guy who wrote the Elon Musk biography and the wonderful Einstein guy? You know, uh, whatever, Apocalypse from X-Men Apocalypse, that guy, or Moon Knight, uh, you know, Poe Damarano from Star Wars, he's the pimp. And all of these girls, he pimps out. He just pimps them out. So it's not really a mental institution. It's a brothel. And while Baby Doll is asked to perform, she has fantasies. Now, this is a very, uh, this would be like level one of the perception of this movie. And this is why, yes, uh, let me say it, Sucker Punch is a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece because it went over all of your heads. When it goes over everyone's head and only the eye of AKA Pad can see through the bull crap and see something for what it is the nucleus so to speak <sighs> what has happened in the film criticism what's happened to you guys you guys let too much of social media program yourself so baby doll she pole dances or she lap dances and then she has these fantasies she's a, a samurai warrior princess we're in ww2 and the list goes on and these sequences are giant bombastic part music video, great music, great design work, slow motion walk, slow motion explosions, all of the things we love about Zack Snyder to where when other filmmakers do what Zack Snyder does, they get heralded, but Zack Snyder invents it and does it and performs it. He gets thrown into the gutter. What are we doing? So that's level one. She lap dances, has these fantasies. Here's level two. She's having the fantasies. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor of a metaphor almost. Like, you know, like we drill down. But these fantasies are her mind saying no. And she is fighting against whatever's in front of her to complete the task. Lap dancing. She doesn't want to lap dance. In her mind, let's have a little bit of an allegory of the battle in her mind. And then here's... The real level, the real level, is that she's not lap dancing or pole dancing or shaking her TTs and her uh, her rumpy rump. She's performing a SEX act. She's performing an SEX act, and it's so horrific, and it's so brutal, and it's so damaging to her mind. She puts her mind away, and as she puts her mind away, we get... You know, the sucker punch fantasies. And that is the truth of this movie. It's a commentary on what people have to do to cope with adversity in real time. Few movies, I can't think of any movie that comes close to doing something like this on the scale. Now, I don't expect all of you to have that level of insight, that third eye. That's why I'm here. That's why you guys pay attention to me. But where I'm disappointed truly in the creative world, in the art world, in the illustration world, in the design world, in the things that we love that are cool to look at world, why isn't Soccer Punch championed as a masterful piece of design? It's got some of the best visuals in Hollywood history. And the visuals have a through line. They're complete. I don't get it. You people have let me down or not even holding Sucker Punch up to that. Now, similarly, you'll be like, similar, like similarly, we have something like the fifth element that no one liked the story, no one understood it, but the design and the look of that movie guy held up and what else do we uh, similar similar how about blade runner no one no one uh not even ridley scott could explain blade runner that's why they keep recutting the hell out of that movie 
but the visual held up. Soccer Punch should be like the third one in that list that holds up visually. Uh, I'm also a little bit curious to why something like even Ready Player One hasn't resonated yet. I believe it should. Just when it comes to the visual conversation. So all of you, if you live in Philly, you get a little bit of slack. You failed me on this. So that's your explanation. That's what Sucker Punch is. But let's get into the reason why we're all here. The art of... Oh. <laughs> nope. This way. The Art of Sucker Punch. Let's go. AKA Patters. Welcome back to the drawing table. You guys know it was coming. Say hello to Crypt. He's our table mascot now. Come on. You gotta love the 90s. Uh, real quick. I didn't get into this point during the intro. When I was talking about this movie being a commentary on psychiatric practices and mental health this is really uh this is the crux of the this is like what the whole movie crescendos into it collapses into a lobotomy so our baby dog girl uh really goes through a movie of abuse and at the end she gets lobotomized and it's sad and it's heartbreaking and it's it's a true statement to what you know, like how we treat mental health. Now, I, I don't want to go any further than that. But again, these are a lot of the positions, it takes, or points of view that I feel a lot of people gloss over and missed during this movie. And also, too, uh, seems like we got a lot of shadow here. I don't know what we're doing. We're going to try and get into some of the artwork. Now, there's a lot of photography uh, in the later pages, there was a lot of straight up digital artwork. Uh, the, you know, like when things are too digital and too refined, uh, I tend to tune out, okay? But this logo, it is so hardcore. We have the funeral. This part, uh, this is a little bit the leads baby doll into the asylum. And right here, you know, they come for her. Baby doll gets sent away. And uh, it's that. So we have like... Uh, three layers of fantasy also. Uh, let me just illustrate that. And maybe this video is a little bit more of using the art of book to more accurately discuss the movie. Uh, let me just get some sippy soap. Uh, anyway, guys. So, here's what I mean. We have... See, like, this is layer one of the fantasy. How, how she imagines... The people around her. All right. Blue over here. Like I said, he's a pimp. He's the one that sells the girls out. But in Baby Doll's fantasy world, everything is kind of this type of tone. You know, it's very, uh, you know, like 1950s, right? And then the deeper fantasy is the stuff that we love about this movie. I mean, ugh. The visuals, right? And this this is where, like I said, I some some of the artwork, it's it's some of the concept design work now doubles as pre-visualization. As we move through the history of special effects, uh pre-vis was more sketch work and it, it like sketch work, animatics, and then eventually like pre-vis and concept design merged. And that's really where we are with digital uh, film pre-production. But don't make, uh, don't wake the mother. Again, like just like endless big ideas, endless cool things. Uh, Zack Schneider throughout the course of this, he talks a lot about uh, just letting these people go. They wanted to set the visuals and the art up to win. And, you know, anyone, like, if you've seen this movie more than once, you, you would agree with that. And some of this is fantastic, because even here for the, I'm just going, AK Powders, we may not go in order here. Uh, right here, right? This is a 3D model of the castle. The rendering, or sometimes we would call this the output, is, we can see, it's like a pen and ink drawing. It's shaded uh, very 
much like you're using a Copec or a Prismacolor marker. And you might ask yourself, well, why is that even a thing? Why is that even significant? It's significant because the, when this moves through the production line, through the different departments, uh, there's like a certain tone that keeps getting like repeated and echoed and it just keeps everyone on track. So a lot of times, uh, this is what the director does. He, he finds ways to make the vision consistent throughout the entire process. So uh, I saw on Facebook today, because of all the, uh, you know, people just have to bash everything Zack Snyder does. But someone, uh, I saw, like, saw on Twitter, I saw on Facebook, people were like, oh, Zack Snyder uh, should just be a cinematographer uh, with no understanding of film production and what a director actually does. But yeah, so we get, you know, again, we get a lot of these visuals. Here's a cathedral. You know, like, it's, <coughs> it's nice, it's beautiful. Doesn't really get my jollies off. Here's the orcs. Like, look at this dude with the tongue. I love this helmet design. I don't know why. That white stripe works so well. And I keep saying this. So many times when we go through these books, I just want more of this. Like, I want more of the ideas. Like, just the, like, what, what got passed, what got denied, and why. And no one really does it in the level of detail I would like. <laughs> and maybe it's not possible. I don't know. <coughs> but again, here's some concept. Uh, they will call this like a keyframe. So a lot of keyframes, like I said, they're part pre-visualization. And, you know, like it's used as a keyframe would in traditional animation. Meaning you have a crew that does this level of work. And, you know, you get it in so many different beats and then you give it to the next crew and they fill in what's between the keyframes and so on and so forth until you get a seamless image. Here's some dragon designs. I, I forgot that this movie had a dragon. I would have said that in the intro. Here's like the dragon's den. Really cool stuff. What do they call it? The final frame baby doll approaching the nest. This is the dragon's nest. Like baby doll here, just like spiking the dragon. Again, just like crazy, fun, wild stuff. Like a B-52 bomber and a dragon. Let, let's just be clear on that. On a live action, big budget movie, we have a fifty, a B-52 bomber and a dragon. This train though. See, like there's things that just scream. Like, that I love. I love the red neon. That kind of, you know, like, you can go, it's an indicator light, kind of, right? Or it's a reflector. But the red stripe, glowing red stripe works so well. And the black and yellow uh, warning, the, the the construction mark, so to speak. It's just, uh, it's so cool to look. And they have it uh, down the size of the pages. And excuse me, I know, I know we're not exactly in... Perfect framing here, but I get excited. I just want to bring things to you guys and I could spend more of my time Doing a perfect setup, but cheers to that. We just like to keep going Yeah, Amber here see and We get like echoes of the same type of lettering the same type of emblems or icons used throughout the movie uh, Baby doll has some of these like dangling from one of her pistols and I believe one of her swords Fantastic Ro robot design. Remember, they fight these in the carriage of the train. They kind of just go through a whole uh, room of them. Like, again, like, cool, wild stuff. And here, see if we get some of the, the storyboards being worked on. Storyboard train sequence. I did like this right here, though. Isn't that nuts? Again, it's just the color sometimes. And again, we live in a digital age. And anyone out there creating, you should take a level of solace in the ability to kind of do kind of like darks and monochromatic well. But then you can also do the crazy bright stuff well. 
and that that's a that contributes a lot to or attributes a lot to the digital age of production. Like this is just wild stuff, though. And it's again like I it's beyond me again. It's beyond me that this has not resonated more. Like where's NECA in doing the sucker punch action figures? Like where yeah, you know, I guess well, you know what? Don't have NECA do them because they would be like something like this, something like Crypt Boy over here. He would be like fifty dollars today. No. Like fifteen bucks. Yeah, and this final sequence here very much reminded me of what I consider the the greatest or second greatest movie of all time, Bobby Falsey's All That Jazz. For some reason, I feel like, it, I don't think he's ever said it, I just feel like he saw All That Jazz, that final dance number sequence in that movie, and did his version of it. And this is really where you see how much of a brothel these girls were living in. You know, they're in the mental institution, they're not dressed like this in the real world, they're literally uh, just sold like they're sold and used and th and this is a part of like the trauma of all of these girls and we kind of just focus on baby doll and how she uh processes all of that that's the point of this movie everyone but look at this though. like holy crap the pinks like you guys watch enough of this channel you know i love the blue and the pink backgrounds these posters were great. Uh, this one, like, you know this one. Prepare to be licked. And you know nobody, nobody would get that done today. Yeah, you know, like, and there's, there's a, you know, like a masculine bravado uh, that come through the women in this movie. Uh, this isn't just a, I, I realized earlier, uh, you know, someone made the reference of this being like a male fantasy, but it's, it's male fantasy through female empowerment. And this, I would really, like, this is some of the stuff where I think down the line, you you get these publicity shots of the girls, like, kind of, like, in full costume, in full action. And then you you build around it. And that's kind of, like, what this this right here looked like. And some of this could could have been maybe, like, posters from the San, San Diego Comic-Con. So earlier, I referenced that. So here... They, they pretty much have the artwork I was talking about, which are these. And they were t-shirts that they pretty much gave away at San Diego. And I don't know if they did some posters later, because like very common, they would give, uh, and Marvel made uh, big use of this, you know, where they would give these out. And, you know, everyone would be walking around with them. And you got that from uh, Captain America, First Avenger, Arn. You got that for Thor. You got that, like, you know, Arn and all. The, the logo work here, like, this is this speaks to me. Like, all the logo ideas, all the icon ideas. Zach does discuss here, uh, look, how much pain and sorrow can a fragile young mind take? I mean, he breaks down the, the points I'm trying to make to you guys here. Until, until like, just to give you guys a little bit of background. I shot the intro, and then I sat down to go through this book. And for whatever reason, I thought I read more of this. There's not a lot of text in here after, like, the first couple of pages. I thought I read it. I never really did. So, a little bit of validation on my end. So, again, you guys trust AKA Pad. Uh, not a lot of work on this early anime stuff, though. Like, not a lot of detail, not a lot of how we found the artists, what we did with them, what they gave us. Not And, you know, because we're right into the production. We only get two pages of the anime girls. But, yeah. And then we're off to making the movie. Like, I love these. Like, these are just... They have them for each character. So, like, the front end of this book is just more or less, like, character profile stuff. And, and again, like, tell me, tell me we're in only, like, so for Sweet Pea here, 
you would make the argument that Sweet Pea wearing this with the with the gun, with the scoop on it, this is the one fantasy. But then, no, no, there's a, a middle fantasy, and then this is the reality. Like, so, it is three levels. Rocket. I forget this girl's name, but she has been chopping at the bit, right? Like, we all, we still want her in Batman vs. Superman, <laughs> but she got cut out to some degree, right? They were, I think, prepping her to be Batgirl. And Amber here, she is, right, from MTV. Uh, she's been in a couple good movies, right? Hangover. Uh, this is Amber and Truman Capote. Just joking, not Truman. But yeah, everyone, this book, um, it kind of jumped. I totally forgot, too, that, uh, I forget his name. Mad Men. Uh, what's this guy named? John, John, I want to say John. Uh, is it in here? Ugh. Okay. You, you guys, you put, <laughs> let me know in the comments. But he's, he's the uh, doctor. It's really, it's just so much fun to go through these books sometimes, though. Like, look at this artwork. The paradise for the, the end of the movie. Like, just really, like, or, so I would call this, so if someone kind of was co commissioning me, and we were trying to decide, like, what a direction was or something, uh, I would call this, like, an ornament. And, and it's somewhat ornamental because... Uh, similar, like with twin shots, you know, like you can split it and it's, it's ornamental because it's more of a, of a logo, an icon or like a word mark. Yeah. So what happened with this book though, is when I bought this book, it may have been 15, $18 off Amazon. I looked it up. It's like 200 on eBay, about one, this edition, there's like three other ones. Um, there's limited edition ones of this. This one's like 140 on Amazon, at least 200 on eBay. And to close out, let's let's do something depressing. <laughs> uh, I had no idea, but look, it retailed for $35. So this book today would be about a $60 book, just retail, which is absolute madness. Guys, uh, yeah, just wanted to share it with you. Uh, not a detailed flip through from cover to cover. Uh, just really wanted to highlight my how I view the movie using this as assistance. And guys, I get it. We all we all don't have to like the same thing, but I think it's valuable to give everything a shot and be patient with a lot of the things in front of us. I think it's important.